passage that we're going to be looking at this morning in Ephesians chapter 5 is really addressing a problem within the church, in the Ephesian church at this time. But it's really a problem for every single church and every single believer. You had Gentile believers in the, pas- in the passage here, they were going back to their old lifestyle. In other words, they had come to faith in Jesus, but now they're going back and living their pre-faith lifestyle all over again, which was really sort of all around them. And that's a problem. Like it's a problem for every church and every single believer. I mean, every single one of us has probably had moments in our lives where we've sort of felt like, well, you know, this is what I used to do. Why not go do it? I mean, sort of just fits. I know how it goes, the whole bit. Now, every person has sort of a different angle on this one. For example, the Jewish believers at that time, when they would struggle with going back away from their faith, they would typically struggle with legalism. Because in their faith, everything was based on these rules and and these laws and everything like that. So if something's not going right, the easiest thing for them to do was turn and go back to the law. We'll just keep all these rules and then you're going to kind of get on the right track again. For the Gentile believer, it was different. They weren't raised around legalism. They were raised around license. And so basically everything was okay for them. No matter what you do, it's fine. I mean, do what you want to do. Just find your own happiness. You know, do it all and everything will be fine. And so, you know, for them to return to their old life basically was just to go back and act like everybody else that still lived around them, which wouldn't be hard to do. Kind of sounds a little bit like today in some ways, right? The problem is, is that the Bible is really clear that when you and I come to faith, in Jesus Christ, change happens. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us that the, you know, that the new comes, the old, it passes away if we're in Christ. And so we should be changing. And you stop and you think about it. I mean, God comes and he, he like that song talks about, he calls us out of the grave. He, you know, he, gives us, he takes us from death to life. He gives us brand new life. We become born all over again. He puts his spirit inside of us. He starts changing the desires that we have. I start loving people that I don't even know. And, then, and I start having you know, a sense of what is right and what's wrong. And I, start, I feel like I should be in church even though I don't even know why. I remember when I was you know, 14 years old and I came to faith in Jesus. And, and you know, I just felt like I should start going to church. And I didn't know why. I mean, I felt like I should be in with God's people because there was something about it felt like this is my family. God starts laying on us the idea that I need to start knowing him. I need to be into the word because I need to start understanding what he's asking me to do with my life. Things like the Ten Commandments now have meaning to me. I start seeing the value of putting him first and every human life has dignity and and I start seeing these things that that are important that maybe I didn't get beforehand. And so the point that Paul wants to make in the passage that we're looking at today is if someone were to come along and tell you that as a Christian, you don't have to be concerned anymore about keeping God's commandments and you don't have to worry about really obeying God You know, he saved you, and so really, you can basically do anything you want at this point. That Paul is going to call those words empty. Those would be the words that would deceive us. And he's going to tell us, don't let that happen. Because that's going to destroy your testimony, your witness. It's going to dishonor God. And so I thought this morning, before we jump into the text... Let me just pray and I'd ask you just to join with me that our hearts would be right before the Lord. Would you do that? Father, this morning I pray that you would make it obvious to all of us what it is that you want us to avoid, how it is that you want us to live, what it is that we should be excited about, Lord, in our lives so that we can honor you in all that we say and we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Ephesians chapter five. Look at verses six through 14. Now six is actually where 
uh, Thomas took off, last, or excuse me, finished up last week. It's where we're going to start again this week, and I think you'll probably see why. He starts in verse 6, and he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of these things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, what Paul's going to do here in this little section is, he's going to give us four commands that I think are pretty important because they're going to sort of build up to what he says at the end there in verse 14. The first thing he's going to tell us here is in verse 6, is don't be deceived. Go back and look at it. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. He says, don't get fooled. Don't allow people to say things to you or give their philosophy to you that are completely empty, that are meaningless. And what he means by empty and meaningless is, don't let them tell you things that will trivialize or justify sin that make it okay for you to go out and live a lifestyle that would be dishonoring to God. Don't let that happen. And by the way, there were a lot of those things in the Greco-Roman world at that time that were going on. For example, one of the most prominent philosophies that was out there that had begun to seep into the church was something called antinomianism. Now, anti is against, right? Antinomianism was against moral law. That had begun to seep into the church. Now think about what that means. You're talking about a moral God who calls our lives out to be different. And what he's saying is don't let these people come in that are coming in going, well, we're against the moral law. There shouldn't be anything you have to do at all. You see, their philosophy was or their belief was that as a Christian, there's really nothing now that you have to obey. Nothing that you have to do you can do whatever you want. In fact, they actually got to the point where they said, you know, because God has saved your soul and he's left you here in this fleshly body, just give in to the flesh and do whatever it wants so you don't have to battle all the time about it. Just go ahead and do that and God's grace will cover you. You realize what they're saying? Sin's no big deal. It's no big deal. In fact, they were even at the point where they would say, look, when you sin, you actually give God a chance to show his grace again. In fact, they got to the point where they even say, you know, it's actually a good thing because God's grace gets to be on display again. And the world will see that. That, wow, God's gonna save that guy because this guy's terrible and then God's grace will be shown again. Paul has dealt with this before. This wasn't just something that was just happening in the Ephesian church. This was something that happened really all over Asia Minor. Let me show you something. Keep your finger here in Ephesians 5 and go back to Romans chapter 6. Because Paul has to deal with this with the Romans as well. Remember, these are philosophies that are coming out of the Greco-Roman world. So Paul stops off in, verse, in chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2. Listen to what he says. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Isn't that the argument that the antinomians were giving? Hey, just keep sinning and God will keep showering you with grace. He'll cover it all. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we should die, who died to sin still live in it? In other words, see, we're not supposed to keep doing that. We're not supposed to test God's grace. We're not supposed to keep doing that so God will continually, you know, to forgive us. The point being is if God has actually saved us, I ought to be walking away from that. You 
the antinomians were coming along and they were dividing the church. They were confusing people. I mean, their arguments had a sense of logic to it, not godly logic, but a sense of logic to it that just made sense. Well, if God saves you and his grace covers you, why don't you let grace just keep going? Paul's actually gonna describe them in a certain way. If you're in Romans, go back to Romans 16, to the last chapter there in Romans, and look what he says in verses 17 and 18. Because he's got a fitting description of who these people really are. He says in verse 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. That's who these people really are. He said, avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. In other words, these people are not serving God. What they're serving is their own flesh. They've come up with this thought in their mind, look, because God has saved me by grace, I can do whatever I want. All I have to do is ask him to forgive me, and he will, and there's absolutely no consequence. By the way, if you don't think that's true, in Galatians chapter 6, you know, when, when Paul writes there to the Galatians, he says, don't, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he'll also reap. You don't get away with it. But that's the philosophy that they were living with. And Paul calls that type of a philosophy empty. It's without substance. It will get you nowhere. In fact, he continues on in verse 6 and he says, because of these things, because of these types of philosophies and the lifestyles that they lead to, God's wrath is coming. And he specifically mentions the sons of disobedience, those who don't believe. Now, when I was studying for it this week, you know, I have to be honest with you. I, I was thinking to myself, wow, that is not going to be a fun thing to talk about the wrath of God. Right? I mean, no one likes the idea of a wrathful God. I mean, wrath looks like God is boiling over in anger. Or God has lost his cool. Or God's like one of those, you know, cartoons where it's just rising up inside of him and he's getting redder and redder and he's just about ready to lose his temper and just explode and go ballistic on everybody. That's not God. That's a human depiction of what a fallen person might do, but it's not God. In biblical literature, wrath is less about God's anger and more about God's judgment and by the way, every single person who is alive, who's ever lived, will face God's judgment. Now, as a believer, my judgment's gonna be different than an unbeliever. As a believer, my judgment comes to what have I done with the gospel in my life? What have I done with God's salvation in my life? Have I honored God? Have I, have I helped build his church? Have I helped do the things that God wants me? Have I, have, have I given him glory in all the things, or do I lose my reward? It's not going to affect my salvation. I'm going to go to heaven. But for the unbeliever, it's different. For the unbeliever, God will one day hold them accountable for honoring him, for ignoring him. God will hold them accountable. You know, in Philippians chapter 2, there, you know, the author writes and he says that one day every single knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. You know, some people will do that out of great joy, and others will do it as if their arm is being twisted in the back. But judgment will come. Because it's not okay to ignore God. That's why, the chief thing, the end result of ignoring God, of not honoring him, would be judgment. And the truth is, Christianity gets a lot of pushback on this. I mean, people will say, you know, I love the idea of a loving God. I mean, I love it. I mean, I, you look at Jesus in the Gospels, wow, that's really wooing, and, you know, he lives this wonderful life, and he said amazing things, and he, he reached out, and he touched lepers, and he helped people that were poor and hurting, and, boy, that's the God that I really want. Yes, that's a side of, of, a, of a loving God, but a loving God is also holy, and therefore he holds every single person accountable because he's just. That's not quite so popular. People will say, you know, I, I've had a lot of people actually tell me this, you know, I could see God punishing evil when it comes to somebody like the Nazis. 
You know, I mean, they're bad. I could see God taking care of that. But what about just the average person? Well, I want to encourage you. The issue is not whether someone is good. Judgment of God has nothing to do with whether someone is good or not. Because frankly, the issue of good is completely off the table with us because if you think about who God is and who we are, they don't equate at all. God is totally and completely perfect. Now, you could be actually the best person in this room. You might actually give all that you have to the poor and you might help every old lady across the street that you could find and you, you, know, you might do all those things. You help everyone that's in need, but it fundamentally does not change who you are as a person and that is imperfect. You are not like God. You have flaws and faults. And you need a holy God who has a way of reaching down and taking us and calling us out, like the song says, out of the grave. We need that in our lives. And that requires us not ignoring God. That requires us honoring God. In fact, go back to Romans chapter one and I want you to see something about God's judgment. Romans chapter one. Look at verses 18 through 25. Verse 18 says this, for the wrath of God, again, the judgment of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, in other words, those that would not turn to, to God, and unrighteousness, those that have done wrong, of men who have been unrighteous, un, have unrighteously suppressed the truth. For what they know about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but, in their futile heart, but, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And therefore, as a result of all that, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonor their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature that is us rather than the creator. That's not okay with God. Now let me see if I can explain it to you in terms maybe that we could think about it for us. Imagine for a second that there's a mom who has one child, okay? And she teaches this child to, to do good, to be truthful, to work hard, to care for the needy. She loves him, she listens to him, she cares for him. She teaches him how she wants him to live. And he mostly listens to her. And then he graduates from high school. And he goes off and, and the mom makes the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, she literally gives every single thing that she has to, to send him to college. And she does. And while he's there, she pays every single bill. And then the day comes and she graduates and he owes nothing and he's able to walk out and get a great job, and she is taking care of every single thing that there is. But after he graduates, he never talks to her again. He doesn't answer her emails. He won't answer her phone calls. He doesn't respond to her letters. Her reason, his reasoning is really, really simple. Hey, I'm basically doing what she wants, you know, what she asked me to do. I'm just not interested in knowing or honoring or talking to her. Is that okay? how would you answer that? Because biblically, God would answer, that's not okay. That's not okay with him. It's not acceptable to live a good life and yet ignore the one relationship with the one person to whom you owe everything to. The one that's given you life, that sustained you, that's paid every bill, that's done every single thing, who is in fact your creator. God says it's not okay for you to ignore him in Romans chapter one. That's why the wrath of God would come. 
Now keep going here, because now he's going to give us the second thing here in verses 7 through 9. He's going to tell us, stop doing what they do. Look at verse 7, back in in Ephesians 5. He says, therefore, do not become partners with them. In other words, stop living your old life. Well, why? Because you're not who you used to be. You've been changed. I love how he begins that in verse 7. He says, therefore, in other words, as a result of looking back and seeing those empty philosophies that led to all these sinful lives, he says, don't keep doing that. A result of their, their philosophy is you get away from God. Don't do that. Don't join in with them. Don't participate with them. Don't live the life that they are living. And to me, honestly, it makes sense. I mean, in this sense, if you read it like that, you go, oh, well, that's just a guy telling us don't sin anymore. But you need to think about how practical this really is. Let's say for a second that, you know, you're a recovering alcoholic. And you're really trying to quit. You don't go show up at a bar every night because that's what you've done for the last five years. Because that's what you're used to or you know people there. If there's gonna be a change in your life, you've gotta back away from that and go someplace else. That doesn't mean you can't love those people there and have a friendship relationship, but it means you don't go to the place that's gonna cause you to fall and stumble. That's what he's talking about. Don't go to the place, don't participate with them. Look at verse 8. He says, and for, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Do you notice what it says there? You were darkness. Now, notice here that the verb were isn't modified by a pronoun here, like in or of. So it, it says here, so it doesn't say you, you were in darkness, or darkness was around you or by you, it literally says you were darkness. You were a part of it. There was a time when you were lost, that you were just a part of the world system. You're not anymore. Not now. Now you're to live differently. Now you're to be children of light. See, now it makes sense when you start thinking about when Jesus is walking along in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus stops, and he's looking at his disciples, and he says, look, let your light shine before men in such a way that they can all see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, if you were in darkness, you wouldn't have a light to shine, right? But when you come to faith in Christ, we become children of light. We become lights in a world. God is expecting us to let our lights shine. Now, light is, um, light is used all over the scriptures. It's, in fact, it's typically used two ways in the Bible. Intellectually, light has to do with what we believe, what we think. Morally, it has to do with what we do. And so intellectually, what I believe and think ought to be God-honoring. And the only way I can do that is for me to be in the scriptures, It's very difficult for me to find a a philosophy of life that really works if that philosophy comes on ABC, CBS, or NBC. Because it seems like every philosophy I see on every TV show is about, well, this is the the, the thing that I'm involved in, and I know that, know, that, that a holy God wouldn't like that, but it just feels so right, and we love each other. That's not the philosophies of my life that I ought to be gravitating towards. I ought to be going back to God's word and going, God, what do you say? about life, how I'm supposed to live. And morally, I don't partner with darkness anymore because God has called me out of darkness. Again, like the song that we were singing, you know, he calls me out of the grave. I don't come out of the grave and go, I'm going back in because my friends are in there. That's dead. Look at verse 9. He says, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. So the goal of life now is since God has made me alive spiritually is to live like I'm a a child of the light. And verse 9 tells me what it looks like. It looks like a life that produces a certain kind of fruit. And by the way, everything that's healthy produces fruit. In this case, the fruit of the light would be the opposite of the fruit of darkness in verse 11. The fruit of the light here is goodness, 
You know, that sounds so cheesy almost. Goodness. I mean, to us, you know, we think of, you know, little kids being, you know, all, they're just, it's a good little kid, you know. No, goodness is the opposite of evil. And then righteousness. The opposite of, of doing the unrighteous thing or the wrong thing. Truth. The opposite of lying. The point being is, is that when you and I realize who we are, who God has made us to be, that he's called us out of darkness into the light, the, light that, the life that we begin to live is almost a polar opposite of what we used to do because of the, our, our spirits have been changed. Now there's a third thing he says here in verses 10 through 12, and that is find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Look at verse 10. He says, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. In other words, start pursuing a life that pleases God, not a life that's ruled by your feelings, not a life that's ruled by a comfort level, but a life that's really based on God's word. And I need to learn to figure out where God's heart is on things. What pleases him? You're not going to get that, you know, from some weird experience. You know, I can't tell you how many people will say things to me that, you know, instead of going to the Word to find out what God wants for their life, people will say things like, you know, I just went to this Chinese restaurant and I opened up this fortune cookie <laughs> and it said that, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, meet somebody special in my life. Really? Because that was made like six months ago in Detroit. You know? Or someone will come along and say, the cloud moved a certain way and then the sun shined through a certain way and God really just spoke to me. You know, or someone else will, will come along and say, I was just standing there and this bus came by and it had this, you know, this ad on the side of it and it was like, boom, the light came on. That's not how you're supposed to find God's will for your life. If you want to find God's will for your life, you need to get in the book. That's how God's going to lead us. Look at verses 11 and 12 again. He says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. In other words, don't harbor sin. Get it out into the light. You know, look at life through a, a different perspective here, through God's perspective. Verse 12, he said, it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. I, I'll tell you what I get from that. Stop talking about sin. Quit gossiping about it. Quit dwelling on it over and over again. Go back and read things that are going to build you up and encourage you. And leave those things to the past, to the dead. Now, there's a final thing he tells us here in verses 13 and 14 is that we need to start living like we are alive. Look at verse 13. He says, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, that is a, 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 a it's sort of paraphrase, basically, from Isaiah 60. In fact, open up your Bibles to Isaiah 60. Go back to the left, large Old Testament book. Go to Isaiah 60 here, and I want you to just look at the first two verses. Isaiah 60. Now, let me tell you why this is an important verse. Isaiah 60 is written to the Israelites about the nation of Israel. But Paul quotes it here in Ephesians. That tells me it's good for all of us. This matters to all of us. So listen to the promise here. Isaiah 60, verse 1, he says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. I mean, God is doing amazing things. He has made you alive. That's our calling, church. That's... That's who we are. We're supposed to come alive. We're supposed to rise from the old. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to trust in God for something better, for something more. We're to become awake 
We're supposed to be cognizant and, and ready and alert. We're supposed to rise from the dead, not go back and lay down in a coffin all the time and act like everybody else around us. Now think about what this means. See, faith, when it's authentic, it looks alive. It should move us. It changes us. The mere thought of the fact that you come to a place and you, you stop before the Lord and you ask God to come into your life and to forgive you, the reality is he's given you new life and that life is an eternal life which you cannot lose and you're gonna, you've got this amazing sense of God's protection because he's, now he's adopted you into his family. He's put his Holy Spirit in your life. He's sealed you with it because now you belong to him. He's given you a purpose in life, a brand new family full of people, a reason for being here. If that doesn't excite you, I don't know what would. Something has got to be wrong if that doesn't excite us. I mean, in the context of what Paul is saying here, you've got to get the picture of this. He's going along saying, look, stop listening to these people. Stop doing what they're doing. Get into my word and act like you're different. Act like you're alive. And by the way, I'm not telling you to, to fake excitement. That would be empty. But what I am telling you is if you don't get excited about the fact of what God has done in you and for you, you're not thinking enough about what God has done with your life. Maybe you need to pray like King David did in Psalm 51, 12, where he said, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Do you remember that time in your life? Can you remember it when you were just excited about your faith. And you just, I mean, I remember I was 14 years old and I was in this meeting, there were about 400 high school kids and this guy gave the gospel and he said, if you wanna pray this prayer, raise your hand, I did. You know, he said, I want you now to come forward. I was the only kid that did. And, and he says, I want you to come forward. I, I was thinking, I'm not gonna do that. And next thing I know, I'm doing this. And I'm like, what are you doing? You know, and, and so I, I went forward, I prayed that prayer. I remember how excited I was in my faith, I couldn't even explain it. But I was just excited. I really truly felt forgiven. I truly felt loved. And then life kind of just takes over. And it's like that thrill and that excitement just sort of wane a little bit and wear off a little bit. And I'm now I'm not quite excited and I think much more about my problems than what God has just done in my life. Paul is telling us you got to return. you got to come back to that. You need to wake up and realize he's called you out of the grave. He's given you new life. He's changed everything about you. And folks, if you're not experiencing that ex kind of excitement and joy, then maybe the problem is you haven't done the first two things you're still listening to too many worldly philosophies and you're still participating and it becomes really impossible for you to experience the joy of the Lord in your life. It shouldn't be like that. What are you excited about? Because if it's not what God is doing in you and has done for you, you need to get on your knees and ask God to change you. Would you pray with me? Appreciate it. Just for a second, you could stop right where you're at. Maybe pause for a second, close your eyes even so you can focus in on you. In all honesty, are you experiencing the joy of your salvation? Paul encouraged the Ephesians, arise. Come awake, wake up. Maybe that's what we need to do. Would you stop right where you're at and just ask God to wake you back up again spiritually? Father, would you restore to us 
who are calling out to you right now, would you restore to us the joy of our salvation, God? Would you help us to come awake? Would you help us to arise, to come out of the grave, to sense that you are waking us up to honor you and to love you? Thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.